Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, just uh, on a point, um, although there's a bit of a contest for who takes a jump here, if there's anybody from the Labor Party who's got something to say, I'd be happy to wait and listen and wait, give them an opportunity. But uh, I'll just offer that opportunity, Mr Deputy Speaker. Yes. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the Labor Party won't, indefe won't even defend this mangy bill. <laughs> I mean, that's an absolute joke. The Deputy Premier came in and uh, spoke to the amendment. He was a, a lonely, lonely man uh, speaking at the dispatch box. Had nobody to support him. And now we've got uh, the, uh, the very noisy uh, leader of government business over there who's got a lot to say, but no doubt won't have a contribution to make tonight. Uh, the other member for Bass, uh, Mr Whiteman, has already made it clear uh, by interjection across the chamber that he won't be addressing this bill. The Labor Party have been shamed into uh, not even offering up speakers on this important bill. I mean, what happened at the historic day? What went wrong there? But you're so shame, ashamed now of what you are willingly doing to our, willingly doing to our state, and yet you know, you're willing to interject, but you're not willing to make a substantive contribution. Isn't that interesting? Willing to do this. You know, right, you're Mr. willing Ferguson, to. You, you would attract less interjections yep. if you addressed well, your remarks I am, because the chair. I, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm simply very, very interested in hearing what the Labor Party members in Bass have to say about this dodgy piece of lawmaking. By interjection, I absolutely support this. I support the industry. Is this your speech? Is this your speech? Is this your speech? No, that was an interjection. No. Too ashamed to speak to the speech. Too ashamed to speak to this dodgy bit of lawmaking. And uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that actually got me very, very interested in, uh, in, a, in a bit of history here. Interestingly, from uh, Mr Booth, who's uh, just reassumed his seat, uh, I've got an email that was sent to Mr Booth uh, yesterday evening from Mr Graham Elphinstone, uh, Managing Director of Elphinstone uh, Engineering and Weighing Systems. And it was very interesting hearing from Mr Booth, uh, who was talking about uh, um, improving the state. Well, this is what Mr Elphinson had to say to Mr Booth, Booth last night. He said, uh, uh, all I ever hear from you is knock anything anyone does. You never have any constructive ideas of your own that will help the economy of this state. He says, it's easy to be a destroyer. It takes real people to be creative and see the way forward and build on the good to improve what we have. We need primary jobs in this state for it to be able to support the public service education, health and police. Later in the email he says, later in the email he says, we need politicians who work to manage our state, make clear decisions and allow businesses to get on with business so that the less privileged get a fair go and those who are willing to take the risk to run businesses and create employment can do so. He says to Mr Booth, it's past time you step back and had a good look at yourselves. He's speaking of the Greens here. Have a good look at yourselves and help all the good, hard-working people of our state be proud again in what they are doing to make Tasmania great. Mr Deputy Speaker, who is Mr Elphinson speaking about when he says be proud again uh, to help all the good, hard-working people of our state be proud again in what they are doing to make Tasmania great? He's talking about the business community. He is especially talking about the family business community of Tasmania. And what a disaster, what a disaster to hear the leader of government business in Bass, the honourable member for Bass, Ms O'Byrne, gabbing on about how proud she is of this legislation. Well, she should be ashamed, but she's apparently proud. Um, Ms O'Byrne and Mr Whiteman with her in Bass, uh, not Mr Booth, but the, Labor two, the two Labor members were elected under this platform that you published under teambartlett.com.au, building a strong Tasmania. And so when you say that you're proud to bring in this job-destroying, industry-killing legislation into this House, and you at the same time say that you're proud, I wonder, well, what are you proud of when you were elected under a platform of promising to extend the RFA? How are you going with that one? You said that it's you said that oh you get all upset but you've got to have an opportunity you have an opportunity you know you can keep your uh, you can keep those uh, little noises coming but you have your opportunity if you really believed in the bill why don't you get up and speak to it 
Why is it that the Liberal after Liberal after Liberal speaks peppered him with the odd green here and, and there? It's the same speech. It's you won't defend speech. your dodgy yeah. legislation. You I would have thought right. if you're going to kill off a whole industry, like you'd be willing to you'd be willing to speak to it. To but no, all you can do is do your cheeky little interjections and you're selling out jobs in our electorate of Bass, but you don't have the courage of your convictions to stand up and say so. What's more, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that in that so-called forestry, a balanced approach policy that Ms O'Byrne and Mr Whiteman uh, were elected uh, under that platform, it talks about all the extra investment that they will make uh, under three other separate initiatives, extending the RFA a million dollars, implementing the Tasmanian Forestry Industry Plan, uh, two million dollars, and that was spelled out in the policy, and promoting Tasmanian timber, three and a half million dollars. Well, they've now formed government with a party that's actually been demoting, devaluing Tasmanian timber all around the world. And Mr McKim, the leader of the Greens, uh, he got uh, embarrassed today when he alleged that there was not a single contract that could be pointed to that Tasmania has lost as a result of e uh, economic sabotage. Yeah. And there it is. It was the Taran oh, contract with the London they Olympics. To they America. wanted to build. They wanted, Tasmania could have been part of the London Olympics. Tasmania could have been part of that. And Mr McKim has been caught out. You know, he, he pretended it wasn't a case. Ferguson, Mr Booth has taken point of order. I wish it was But it must be a genuine point of order. <laughs> the uh, reality is that the Taran lost that uh, contract because they lied about where and the point of order, order is. Well, Mr. Mr. Ferguson, we're going to do this later. Mr. Speaker, no, you've warned him repeatedly. Mr. Deputy Speaker, you have warned Mr. Booth repeatedly tonight about fifty percent of the time. I have warned nearly every member of this house. Mr. Deputy Speaker, if I may finish and simply point out, I have warned nearly every member of this house. Mr. Deputy Speaker, if I may finish and simply point out. You have warned Mr Booth repeatedly about fake points of order. What will you now do? Not tonight. Having I warned him. <laughs> no, I've only warned him tonight about interjecting. Yeah, well, it's just another warning. And let's continue. Mr disorderly. McKim, caught out. I'm sorry, I'm caught sorry, out. Point of order. Point of order, Mr Deputy. Point of order. Point of order. Lead for government the business. The standard orders are very clear about reflecting the upon the chair. So if down. you choose to move dissent, in the Speaker's yeah. ruling, then you may do so, but you Thank cannot you, reflect speaker. inappropriately upon it's the my chair. my contribution, Mr finish. Deputy Speaker. Excuse me, Thank I have to you. finish my point of order. order. I haven't, but the member's still on her feet, but she has the my point of order. I'm actually, I'm now concluding a Deputy Speaker can rule before you interject. I'm not going to I can't hear what the member is saying. Could I ask the Leader for the House to repeat the second half of her point of order, please? I wasn't able to hear it because of an argument that was progressing. My point was that uh, it is inappropriate to reflect upon uh, the chair or a decision of the chair. If Mr, if Mr Ferguson chooses to move dissent in your ruling, that is a matter for him. But it is inappropriate, after you have ruled, for him to continue say, saying that uh, he has a belief about how you could have acted and it's a reflection upon the chair. Thank you very much and we shall now move on. Thanks, Mr Deputy Speaker. Caught out red-handed that Minister McKim was either unaware or tried to create the false impression in the parliament that there had been no lost contracts. Of course, Tasmania could have been a part of the London Olympics. That's what we could have had, and that's what this movement, that Mr McKim and his, uh, and the, and, uh, his group of Greens, that's the movement that they're part of. It's all part of the, uh, the Green uh, Conservation Extreme uh, family, and that's a fact. Um, and now, it's interesting that the Leader of Government Business, Ms O'Byrne, uh, member for Bass, she, she has a lot to say, uh, but she won't stand on her own two feet and make a contribution to the debate. Mr Deputy Speaker, it has to be said this I'm is a woman who has, who has attempted in the past to stamp out the forest industry in Tasmania. <laughs> so now, is, that, uh, is, it, is it history repeating? And I'll put it to you that yes, it is. Ms O'Byrne Ms O'Byrne like was uh, a candidate uh, for election in 2004 uh, under Mark right? Latham. There's no way and Mark Latham was trying to lock up Tasmania with a policy of uh, uh, something like 240,000 hectares at the time, half of, what, half of what this government is proposing to give away. Ms O'Byrne uh, was uh, devastated, uh, as was uh, Mr Sidebottom at the time, because it was a, a definitely anti-Tasmanian policy. And what occurred during that election campaign was the blatant grab, or an attempt at least, to go for mainland capital city marginal seats. That's what it was about. That's what the political science at the time was, was doing. Latham was uh, touring the southern forests with Bob Brown uh, to the annoyance of the now Deputy Premier Brian Green and the then Premier uh, Paul Lennon. 
and uh, eventually he gave in. He gave in and he, gave, he went all the way. For the Greens, he went uh, 240,000 hectares of lockup, uh, at least uh, $800 million of promised funding at the time, and the Labor Party in Tasmania was in chaos, it was in uproar. Uh, Mr Adams, of course, uh, was uh, able to speak of the courage of his convictions, and he accused his leader of a sellout. Just uh, interesting, isn't it, how at the time it was Ms O'Byrne who was actually crowing or attempting to make the best of a bad situation. And uh, in the Mercury on the 5th of October, uh, it says it was Michelle O'Byrne representing Tasmania's marginal, most marginal federal seat, Bass, who was forced to put on a brave face. She said, there, there will be a positive outcome from this. There will be a positive outcome from this. This has been hanging over us for a long time, and most people will acknowledge that something had to be done. Remaining upbeat, Ms O'Byrne said there was good potential for quote unquote job extensions in the plantation softwood industry. Well that went well, didn't it? And Ms O'Byrne was green then. She supported the green uh, Latham agenda at the time and uh, history records that that was wrong for Tasmania. It was unfair on Tasmanians, not because it was a genuine attempt at a conservation outcome. It wasn't. It was not an attempt by Mark Latham at a conservation outcome. What was it? It was an exercise in politics. That's all it was. It was a grab for mainland capital city marginal seats. That's what it was. At that time, in 2004, uh, it's fair to say that there was a fair, fair bit of uh, interest in those mainland capital seats in the Greens party. And uh, Latham did a deal with the Greens to get green preferences in exchange for that Tasmanian uh, lock-up policy. And it was a terrible incident in political history in Tasmania and Australia. Why? Because it because showed, because it showed, <laughs> because it showed that it, there was the Labor Party federally then was willing to but sacrifice the working conditions and the lives and the incomes. You ought to listen, because a lot of people would have been very hurt if it had actually got through. But the Labor Party federally and Ms O'Byrne with it were willing to sacrifice the living standards of Tasmanians in exchange for what? Green preferences in some mainland capitals. That's all it was. Oh, now, now uh, in comes the Minister for Police. Yep, in comes the Minister for Police. So you'll have an opportunity as the Minister for uh, Economic Development. Minister for Economic Development, I would welcome your contribution to the debate, where tonight you can tell us all how good this policy is for economic development in Tasmania. And it was certainly the case that Bass, uh, uh, at the time, Ms O'Byrne, embraced this forest policy, policy and she described it then as a balanced outcome. She didn't believe it then. She was simply trying to put I'm on a sorry, brave face, but she was willing to get caught up in it, unlike Mr Adams, uh, who was willing to stand up, and he said uh, either we change the policy or we change the leader. And he was uh, proudly at the Albert Hall on the same stage as John Howard. And Mr Deputy Speaker, it's certainly the case, in fact, in my first uh, day in this House, when I, uh, in, the, in the same House here, on my first day here, when I had the opportunity to present uh, my first speech. I actually told the story of how uh, John Howard had said to Alexander Downer when they, the Liberal Party, what? I will, thanks. And, uh, and John Howard was. How many other local candidates did John Howard approach before you Mr. were the last man standing? It was uh, John Howard was having a conversation. The objections is. Uh, and Alexander, Alexander Downer told me the story of how he was uh, consulted by John Howard during the midst of all of this. I mean, if you don't want to hear it, you don't have to be here, but I'll just continue. And Alexander Downer tells the story how John Howard, who was contemplating all of this and himself, himself contemplating, well, how do we manage this political issue with all these mainland capital uh, city marginal seats uh, who were swinging on a lot of these green issues because they wanted Tasmania to be uh, you know, they wanted Grab to use Tasmania as their Tasmania environmental conscience. And if you just listen, if you don't want to hear, then that's, that's your problem. But I'll continue. It's my contribution. And John Howard said to Alexander Downer, on, he said, uh, What's the name of our candidate again? He said, But I just, I just am very worried about the families who will be affected if we go the green way. 
And history records that John Howard went to that election with a pro-forestry policy, a pro-forestry policy that was supported by Paul Lennon and I suspect Minister Green at the time. But you know, now you can't help but feel well. With eight years passed under the bridge, uh, my how the Labor Party in Tasmania have fallen. You see, what's changed, of course? What's changed? What's changed is that you've now formed government with these people. For Latham, it was a preference deal. For Latham, it was a preference deal. For Giddings and uh, Green Labor, it's now uh, actually a self survival. And what do you get? What do you get? What do you get for this deal with the Greens? What do you get in exchange for? First of all, you've given them half a million hectares of forest in Tasmania. What, so you deceitful. didn't get a pulp mill. You, you failed on that. And, you, you and the Greens leader tonight, and Mr yeah. Booth as well, you have made it clear they've said things, that you won't you know get trees. the peace. You'll you won't get the peace. So you've given away trees that don't belong to you. You've given away forests that doesn't belong to you. You've actually reversed your mandate because I've already outlined what the Labor Party's forest policy was at the last election. So you've turned your back on that. You haven't sought a mandate. You haven't had the courage of your convictions to go out and fight for this courage. and earn you the right. And courage. now, you've, what is it all really about? It's about getting an extra 12 months of your miserable existence as a government no, to hang no, in there. No, and that's all you get. That's yourself. all you get. And that's why it's, uh, that's, I will judge you by your behaviour. Because you were elected Ferguson, minister for health, lousy minister as you are. You were elected under a platform to support the forest industry. And you've sold out. You, you don't what, even who? have the courage of your convictions to speak. The to this you bill tonight. It's only the Liberals and a couple of Greens uh, who are willing to even say anything about it. But this is hurting people in our electorate. It's going to really hurt people all around Tasmania. What are you and, uh, to give them, Mr. This evening uh, I was reminded them? of an important meeting that was held you at so the Oh well, you know, you can just keep peppering in with those insults. But if you want to make a contribution then you go right ahead. But I think You're you lack the courage. Dishonest. And before the last state election maybe a week or so before, there was a forest rally uh, at the Scottsdale RSL in uh, my electorate of Bass. Uh, it was organised, I think, by the union, the CFMEU, and I do know that Mr Booth was there, and at least he had the courage to take the platform and have a say. You know, didn't get a very good reception, but so too yeah, did a certain issue. candidate, Mr Softly. Brian Whiteman, who today is now a member of this House. And Mr it. Whiteman stood on the stage and he got a good round of applause when he talked yeah, about forestry. Labor's policy on forestry yeah, and he said these words. You he said these honest. words, I've always been a city boy, but since I've been principal of this, uh, of, uh, in this community here at Winnalea District High School, you know, I've really come to understand what country life is all about. And he spoke to the forest policy, which tonight he will be voting against the forest policy that he was elected Nothing under, in and instead he'll be looking voting. to give away an industry to these Greens. Really? And what's changed? Country. What's really changed? What's really changed? What's really that changed that is that Labor lost its majority. No, what That's what's happened. Yeah, and you say it's rubbish. You see, the Minister for Economic Development, he won't have the courage of his convictions. He won't be able, he won't be able to come up here tonight and talk about how good this bill is for what about Tasmanian uh, economic growth. Quality, and this is the minister who would like to talk about his EDP. Uh, he'd like to talk about how good he is would in creating like jobs in Tasmania, but he's only Ferguson? able he's only able tonight to vote to for a bill that will actually destroy Ferguson? jobs in Tasmania. And so this minister, in fact both of these ministers who have got a lot to say only from the sidelines, have actually got uh, jobs on their hands here tonight because their vote tonight and so too it in my own electorate, Mr Whiteman, and so too in my electorate, Mr Booth, are actively sabotaging jobs in our state. It is wrong. It's wrong. Tonight, the Liberal Party gave an opportunity to the Labor Party to actually do the right thing and go back to the people. Since you've changed your position that you were elected under, you should have had an opportunity to go back and explain that you've changed your position and seek the people's permission to go down this completely alternative route. And you haven't been willing to do that. You have not been willing to stand by your own so-called convictions and fight for this. And it's to the everlasting shame of the Labor Party. I believe, deep in your heart, the Deputy Premier and Minister for Forest is feeling very let down tonight, Mr Deputy oh. Speaker. 
and he, so he ought to be. Because after all, he's given it away. He's given away <laughs> half a million hectares really of forest. It was against his platform that he and his colleagues were elected under. He was assured along the way that there'd Not be a pulp mill in there. Office, didn't get the pulp mill. The strategy, and then what's he done now? He's actually not even managed to get the peace that was being promised. What do the media, what do a lot of people in the street call this so-called deal that Mr Booth keeps waving in the air? A lot of people are calling it the forest peace deal. But Mr Deputy Speaker, there will be no peace. In fact, the peace was as short-lived as a minute. Because on the news tonight, we saw uh, all of the usual faces making it quite clear that they will not participate in any peace process because they still haven't been given enough. The Greens believe it's supposed to be more like 610,000 hectares of Tasmanian native forest that should be locked up. They only got 505. So they're, they're a long way behind. They'll support this bill tonight, of course, because it's taking. They're taking, but they won't give. They're only taking, and this is what the Greens do. They're a greedy party. They're a selfish party. And you can't bargain with them in good faith. So the Labor Party is now finding out. David Bartlett had it right when he said that you can't do a deal with the Greens because you'd be doing a deal with the devil. That's what he said. His words have become true. Although David Bartlett very selfishly just wanted to stay on in government and was willing to sacrifice the pledge that he made to not do deals with the Greens. But to keep this government together, to keep this pathetic <laughs> government hanging together, they've had to maintain and continue to give good gifts to the Greens. And tonight they seek to give over half a million hectares of native publicly owned forests away to the Green movement and they don't even get the peace that was supposedly promised as part of this arrangement. It's quite disgraceful. It's just disgraceful. And oh, this parliament, this parliament should not approve this bill tonight. And I hope deep in my heart, given that knowing that it will pass this house eventually, I hope deep in my heart that the upper house, the Legislative Council, see right through the motives of the Premier and the Deputy Premier. I hope earnestly that the Legislative Council uh, members really get across the words that were said tonight in this House uh, by the Greens leader, by uh, Ms O'Connor, the member for um, uh, Denison, and I, said you'd be and I hope that they read the words of Mr Booth, where he makes it clear that under no circumstances does this change his uh, insatiable appetite to destroy everything that exists in the native forest industry. That's what he said. That's what he said. And I hope that the Legislative Council see right through it. Because this is a valuable industry for our state, and we ought to be proud of it. We ought to be proud of the people who have worked the forests. And I really like the way. Um, I'll just compliment Mr. Groom, my colleague in Denison, who made a fantastic case for how the people who really respect and care for the environment and its natural values are, in fact, the people who work in it. There's always the exception, of course. But Mr. Groom made the case beautifully, I think. But the people who work in the, uh, in the natural environment, the people who make their living out of it, they actually get it. They actually understand the need to conserve it, make sure that it's there for future generations. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, I point to the example of land care. The land care movement has been fantastic for this country. I know it's been supported by this government and past ones and federal governments as well. But where did the land care movement come from? It didn't come from the green movement. It didn't come from the conservation movement. It came from the farming movement. It came from agriculture. It came from the people who worked the land. They really got it. They really understood that they had to protect and conserve. They had to look after riparian areas. They had to provide shoulder belts and provide uh, protection against soil loss and erosion. And that's where, that's where land care came from. And Mr Groom has made the point beautifully. But this paradigm that the Labor Party and the Greens present us with tonight is a false one. They try to create the impression that it's a choice between jobs and protecting natural values in our environment. It's a false choice that they present. We can have both. By the way, Mr Deputy Speaker, wasn't that long ago that these people who sit opposite me here in the Labor Party, it wasn't that long ago that they were telling us how well our forest industry in Tasmania is managed. Why, haven't, why hasn't the Minister for Forestry been willing to say that tonight? 
Why haven't you, Minister, been willing to say to this House well, how proud you are speech. of the people who work in the forest in industry? You know, people who have actually worked, uh, educated themselves at ANU, they're foresters, they're professional people. They're not just, uh, you know, they're not just people who are expert at chopping down a tree. They're actually foresters. They're silviculturalists. They're uh, people who with expertise in genetics. There are people who are seriously uh, uh, professional with soil chemistry, uh, with making sure that you can get the best, uh, the best plantation uh, design in order to get the best return over the full rotation period. It's a professional industry. And it wasn't that long ago, again, that the Deputy Premier, who is Minister for Forests, uh, and I remember his uh, predecessor, Paul Lennon, would always be talking about how well the forest industry is managed. Does that mean you can't improve? Of course not. You can always improve, especially with, as you become aware of uh, new information and knowledge gets developed. But the truth is that if there is a downturn, and there is, and if the dollar's high, and it is, that doesn't mean that you have to give it all away. Why doesn't the Labor Party get it? that the Greens have simply exploited an opportunity that while the forest industry has suffered from a market downturn, by the way, a large part of that is due to the uh, Green campaigners overseas, why do you have to give away uh, public forests? By the way, you know, if demand is down, why give away supply? Why lock it up? There's no need. And has anybody considered, and I wonder if the minister is willing to talk about uh, uh, bushfire risk in all of this, because if we take people out of our forests, if we stop working our productive forests, who's going to care for it? Volunteer who's going to... Oh, so the Minister for Police would like to rely on volunteers? Is that what you just said? Is we that do. it? Did you well, say that? That's what happens in Bridgeland. Is that what you just said? So now you're no, taking working it. people out of working forests, and I'm hearing the word volunteer. How are the volunteers going to look after half a million hectares of forest that you're giving away? economic development. Of uh, taking an interjection, twisting it around, yeah. misleading it to yeah. put it on it's hands up. It's dishonest. It's not what I said. Thank you, but it's not a point of order, and he's not the only member who's in the habit of doing that. Well, you interjected your peril, Minister. You talked about volunteers. <laughs> you talked about volunteers when I posed the question, not to you, but to the Minister for Forest, about how are we going to protect these forests from wildfire? Uh, it's, you know, if you want to interject, that's your decision. But you won't be able to rely on the volunteers. You're actually reducing what forestry Tasmania are capable of. Uh, you're going to see less roading. You're going to see a lot less hazard reduction and fuel reduction. And these are all the consequences no. uh, that future generations of politicians will be making apologies for. Oh, They'll be saying sorry. They'll be saying sorry we locked all that up uh, and sorry we allowed the hazard and the fuel to build up over these years. And I hope it doesn't lead to loss of life, but I could see it happening. Mr Deputy Speaker, it wasn't long ago uh, when uh, the government's IGA that was signed by uh, the Premier and the Prime Minister, which I think was very ironic that they signed that death warrant for the forest industry on the day that they launched their economic development plan. But in that document, it promised uh, three important things for industry. Uh, Mr Speaker, what sort of time have we got left? Just a couple You've of minutes. You've got one and a half minutes. Yeah. Promised at least 155,000 okay, cubic okay. metres per year of high quality saw log. It promised 265,000 metres per year of peeler billets and promised 12,500 cubic metres uh, of specialty timber supply. And what do we see in your amendments tonight? And by the way, I take you back, Minister, to uh, what you said to this House as recently as December of last year. You said, I guarantee those numbers, you said, on the 9th of December in this House. You said that you provide that guarantee. And what do we see in your list of amendments tonight? On page three of your amendments, you're already uh, bastardising the figures that you promised. You're taking out 155,000 and you're substituting 137,000. Because again, you've just capitulated. Well, you've industry, been owned. Sorry. You've been bought out. You've been bought. The, the Premier laughs. You've been played for a song because you've given away half a, half a million hectares of forest that you're not entitled to give away, forest that you promised to protect for working, for productivity. You're giving it away. You don't get a pulp mill and you're not even going to get peace. You've been taken for a ride. Thank you.